this is a series of lectures on links between statistical time series analysis and econometric model building. The material is broken down into four main groups. First of all, I shall talk about the relationship between various sorts of dynamic model that are used in statistical analysis and econometric analysis. Some of these are used in particular in forecast comparisons and some remarks about forecast comparisons in empirical work will be a second subject. And then I shall run through the main uh, theoretical topics, identification and estimation, and conclude with some empirical examples which are essentially based on my own work uh, where I'm interested in relating the statistical time series approach and the econometric approach to the modeling of economic time series. The first section then begins by looking at particular dynamic models which are useful in the uh, analysis of economic time series data and laying out some of the basic properties which I use later on. And so if I begin then with a general heading of dynamic models and their interrelationships. What I'm going to be interested in doing is looking at the properties of time series models and the properties of econometric models and at the end of the section basically relating one to another, the, to look ahead to that, the general idea is going to be that there is a sense in which we can interpret a final equation or a solution form of an econometric model as the time series model that a univariate analyst would in fact be fitting. The place I begin is to take the simplest possible case and think of univariate models first. And so my first subsection is going to be uh, little more than a recapitulation of some basic ideas in single series time series analysis. So I begin then with a stationary process uh, denoted by yt. Considering just the single process which has zero mean, constant variance, constant that is of course over time as a consequence of the stationarity assumption, which I write uh, in the standard form using a subscript on the variance symbol to denote the, ver the variable I'm talking about. And in particular, we have some autocovariances gamma j, say, which are just covariance between the series, the variable at time t and at time t minus j. And of course, as a result of stationarity assumptions, the autocovariance function is even. And likewise, we can define autocorrelations. Rho j, where we just simply take the jth autocovariance and divide by the variance. The variance, of course, being alternatively denoted gamma zero. Fine. The autocovariance generating function is something which we shall be using later on. And so this is just an example of a standard generating function idea. I denote this by C of Z, and this is simply the doubly infinite sum gamma j z to the j. And of course, in the case that I'm looking at, namely a stationary process, we can simply make use of the two-sided property and write this as a sum simply over j ranging from 1 to infinity. 
and of course there's a relatively easy relationship between this generating function and, for example, a spectral density function. Likewise, we have an autocorrelation generating function uh, which I denote by the letter G which is of the same form in terms of the argument Z again for J going from 1 to infinity right so these are the basic uh, measures of a stationary process that I shall be looking at. The notation, incidentally, is that used by Kendall and Stewart. In order to represent the autocorrelated behavior of a particular stationary process, we would typically use one or another form of model. And the first I shall briefly recap is the autoregressive model. where we simply assume that the current observation yt is generated by the relation phi 1 yt minus 1 plus phi 2 yt minus 2 and so on up to some number p such terms together with a disturbance term epsilon t Epsilon t is the symbol I shall use for what is known as a white noise process. So we have epsilon t is a sequence of independent, identically distributed random variables. I think the abbreviation IIDRV is, is fairly standard. These have zero mean, again, constant variance. Um, exactly as the uh, original process, but the independence is the distinguishing feature which we're particularly interested in. And these properties together give what is commonly referred to as a white noise process. The autoregressive model which involves p past values of the series itself, we'd, we shall refer to as a pth order autoregression and that can be abbreviated to an ARP model to introduce one more piece of shorthand. And the final piece of shorthand, or notational convenience, is obtained by introducing a lag operator, L, which has the effect, when applied to a particular variable, of simply shifting that observation back one period in time so the lag operator L applied to yt simply produces yt minus 1. Using this uh, notation, then, in the autoregressive model, we can simply write yt... Um, sorry, let me collect terms together on one side. yt uh, minus phi 1 L yt minus phi 2 L squared yt and so on will produce a polynomial in this lag operator L of degree P with coefficients which are exactly the autoregressive parameters given initially. And so if I write the uh, polynomial itself as phi of L using another generating function type of form we can capture the whole model relatively simply where of course phi of L is just the polynomial implicit in the preceding equation. Okay. If this polynomial phi of L is factored into as a product of terms, 
and so the product i going from 1 up to p of 1 minus lambda i l then there is a condition for the stationarity of such a model that is the, the condition that a series generated by a relationship of this form is in fact stationary uh, can be expressed in this form and the stationarity condition is simply that these coefficients lambda i are less than one in modulus so it, under this particular condition which we would normally impose in estimation and analysis the resulting process is indeed stationary in terms of the notions that I introduced initially, autocovariance generating function and so on, this can be very easily written. We have it for a model of this form that the autocovariance generating function is simply given by the error variance divided by phi of z, phi of z inverse. And once again, this, is, uh, this bears an obvious relationship to the um, way in which one would write down the spectral density function for such a process. Um, finally, I mentioned but uh, will not spend any time on the relations between the covariances and the autoregressive parameters, that is, between the gamma j and the phi j are very easy, easily described, um, or if we, turn, we put it in terms of autocorrelations and the autoregressive parameters, then the relations are given by the so-called Yule-Walker equations. These, in fact, make it relatively easy to move from the autocorrelations or autocovariances to the autoregressive parameters. And it's worth mentioning briefly here that that's relatively easy to do for this case, because it isn't very easy to do for the alternative model, which I want to consider next. And in fact, that correspondence will occupy us for a few minutes in this second model. The alternative representation then to mention is the moving average process. Where we simply assume that our current observation yt is generated as a moving average of past observations, or past values on a white noise process up to some number q of such values. In practice, uh, we shall normalize such a relationship by setting the leading coefficient theta 0 equal to 1. If the white noise error has variance sigma epsilon squared, which is not specified numerically, then specifying the leading coefficient to be 1 removes the resulting indeterminacy. Uh, alternatively, we might write yt as theta of L epsilon t using the same lag polynomial notation, that is where theta of L is 1 minus theta 1 L minus theta q L to the q. In other words, is a polynomial of degree q in the lag operator L. And this model, again, we can abbreviate by referring to it as an MAQ model. The measures, then, that we introduced previously, C of z in particular, uh, are easily obtained again as sigma epsilon squared times theta of z theta of z inverse. And the particular feature to note, which comes out of this relationship, or alternatively by taking covariances of yt with its lag value directly, 
is that the autocovariance will be zero at any lag greater than the degree of the process. So in particular here, we would note that gamma j is zero for j greater than q. As I say, that's clear from uh, this particular polynomial product, or it's equivalently clear by looking at the expected value of yt, yt minus j, say, for j greater than q. If we do the same operation on this covariance function uh, and factor, sorry, the same operation on the uh, coefficient polynomial and factor it, then there is an equivalent condition to the stationarity condition over there, which is imposed, but for totally different reasons. If we write theta of z again as a product of factors q in number involving some coefficient lambda again, then what we usually impose is the same condition, or almost the same condition, because we have a weak inequality here rather than a strict inequality. This is a condition which Box and Jenkins refer to as an invertibility condition. But I prefer to think of this as an identifiability condition for identification purposes, that is to say. Because the same autocorrelation function, or autocovariances over here, result if a particular lambda value, any particular one, is replaced by its reciprocal. And to see that, uh, we can work uh, possibly in terms of the autocorrelations for a moment. Um, the statement then is that the same autocorrelations result if um, a lambda value is replaced by its reciprocal. Um, OK, to see that is relatively straightforward. G of z is simply the error variance divided by the process variance into a product of factors of this kind. This is simply using uh, this representation for the theta polynomial in the general definition for an autocovariance or an autocorrelation function. And then we simply observe that if we consider one particular lambda value and consider the pair of factors involving, say, the ith lambda value, then this can simply be written as lambda i squared into the corresponding pair of factors replacing the coefficient by its reciprocal. So apart from the uh, scale factor here, which we would expect to pick up in the leading term as far as the variances are concerned, the remaining uh, product, that is the function of z, is the same when the lambda value is replaced by its reciprocal. Now that means then that if there are, if these lambda values are real and distinct, there may be as many as 2 to the power q possible moving average processes for a given autocovariance function. That is to say, if we are given the autocovariances, or as here, the autocorrelations, which are 0 after some number q, then there may be as many as 2 to the power q different theta functions which would correspond to that. The choice then is between taking a lambda value or its reciprocal for each of the q possible roots, and if these are real and distinct, 
there are two to the Q ways in which that can be done. Okay, so basically then, the, just to state that um, formally, and if the lambdas are real and distinct, there are two to the power Q observationally equivalent moving averages using the observationally equivalent using the term from the uh, discussion of identification in econometrics, but in this case meaning two to the Q MA processes generate the same set of autocorrelations. And uh, the basic condition that we're imposing to impose this condition uh, specifies one of them. So in other words, it is a way simply of choosing from the available representations one uh, with which to work. Well, now, the question that might naturally arise in this situation is um, if we are given any particular set of numbers or any particular set of autocorrelations, that is, numbers between 0 and 1, which become 0 after some particular point in time, whether for any such set of numbers there exists a moving average representation. In fact, the answer to that is no. And the way in which to uh, discuss this, uh, I think, which is best, is to consider the procedure whereby one would actually set out in practice to obtain the relevant factorization. That is, given the covariances or autocorrelations, how, one w how would one set out to obtain the corresponding moving average coefficients? That is, given C of Z, how would one in practice factor it into theta of z, theta of z to the minus 1? And if we can consider how to do that, then we can see uh, how the particular condition which the autocorrelations would have to satisfy, uh, we can see how that condition emerges. So let's consider then this um, factorization problem, or alternatively the relationship between the covariances and the moving average coefficients. OK, so we are interested then in, uh, let's say, to factor C of Z or G of Z into something which involves the possible uh, moving average coefficients. In fact, uh, it turns out to be more convenient to work in terms of the autocorrelation generating function. Um, the first step, then, is simply to write that as a simpler polynomial of degree Q in some variable x. Uh, so I'm going to substitute, then, for z in the original polynomial which is, of course, of this form stopping after Q terms. And having made this substitution, uh, I shall, of course, have a polynomial of the same degree, of degree Q, in X and I shall call that h of x. The next step is to calculate the roots of this polynomial. In other words, to write out the polynomial as a product, again, of q factors of the form x minus xi. And having written it out in this form, we need a normalizing 
constant rho q. This arises since once we substitute um, x into this particular polynomial, then the coefficient of x to the power q is clearly going to be rho q, and so we bring that down here in order to uh, write the product of factors in the usual way. Now, the result which is usually cited in considering the question, can any set of Q numbers represent the autocorrelation function of a moving average process? This result is basically due to Wold and is in terms of this polynomial H of X. Um, let me state the result. And I shall not prove the result. Uh, it is not terribly easy to grasp at first sight uh, why it comes about. And possibly when I have the solution which I'm seeking, I'll come back and refer to this point again. The result of Wold um, is basically for the rows to be autocorrelations of the process, to be autocorrelations of a legitimate qth order moving average process, um, the necessary and sufficient condition, necessary and sufficient condition is that h of x have no real root of odd multiplicity in the interval minus 2 to 2. Now, as I say, on the face of it, this is not a terribly easy condition to grasp. Um, in terms of a condition upon the autocorrelation function, and I shall comment upon it when we uh, have completed the solution for this particular factorization. Okay. Well now, having obtained the roots of this particular polynomial, what we would like to do is to go back and obtain a factorization in terms of the original z's. And it's at this point that we observe the possibility of choosing uh, a root or its reciprocal, which gives us the possibility of 2 to the power q possible representations. Um, the transformation, just to write it again, where is it here, between x and z uh, was that. What it implies is that for any particular root xi, the roots in z, going back to the original polynomial, they satisfy a quadratic obtained by reorganizing this particular relation, that is zi squared minus zi xi plus 1. That is simply taking this relationship and multiplying through by z and collecting terms on the left. And so what this means then clearly is that the roots zi have product 1, and hence we have a reciprocal pair, one on either side of the unit circle. So the roots satisfy that. Um, hence have product 1. In other words, we have a reciprocal pair of roots, typically. Of course, what these roots are, we can write down on the assumption that we can remember the formula for the roots of a quadratic. Zi, in this case, 1 half xi plus or minus root 1 quarter xi squared minus 1. And finally, if we define lambda i to be the root with modulus less than 1, then we have a unique way of choosing a theta of z function. And so uh, 
finally then, and letting uh, lambda i be the root of modulus less than or equal to 1, we form the invertible moving average process as simply the product of those particular factors. Okay. Well, now that basically indicates how one would actually go through the solution. Um, the point to bear in mind now is that there may, in practice, be less than the maximum number 2 to the q such processes in various circumstances. We said that the number of processes is 2 to the q if the lambdas are real and distinct. And clearly, if these polynomials have repeated roots, which are equal, then, of course, there are uh, a number of repeated solutions for theta of z. In other words, we do not get the maximum possible number of distinct processes. So this is one way in which the number of possible um, solutions is reduced below the maximum possible. That is by having uh, repeated roots in the particular polynomials. Similarly, a unit root, if that arises, that is to say if we have a solution for zi of 1, clearly we're not able in that case to choose between that value and its reciprocal, and again the number is less than 2 to the q. And finally, of course, if we have complex conjugate roots for zi, that is, if this final, if this last equation in the center has a, uh, gives complex solutions, uh, then again we have to uh, choose a complex value and its conjugate together in order to ensure that the resulting function is real, because what we're interested in doing is writing down models which will generate real valued processes. Now it's this point which has some uh, bearing on the result as stated over here uh, by Wold. We can see that a real root in the interval from minus 2 to 2 for the x polynomial when inserted into the expression in terms of the roots for z, will clearly imply that zi is complex. Okay? If xi is between minus 2 and 2, the expression inside the square root sign is clearly negative, and the corresponding zi root will be complex. And its complex conjugate will be its reciprocal. Hence, in order to ensure that the resulting process is real valued, we must have another root to associate with that complex conjugate value. In other words, it must be the case then that the root in x within this interval has an even multiplicity. So in other words, we must have two such roots in order to be able to choose a complex conjugate pair when forming the product lam involving the lambdas. Okay, and so it's in this particular context that it's easier to give an interpretation of world's condition that is in terms of the actual solution which we obtained for the moving average um, in the moving average context. Let me uh, just give a very brief example of that condition. And, uh, we, and relate it to the simple analysis which one can carry out, because I will simply take the first order case. So in other words, I assume that row 1 is non-zero, row 2, etc., are all zero. Uh, so g of z, in this case, is simply 1 plus row 1 z plus z inverse. h of x 
translating by substitution is simply 1 plus rho 1 x, or equivalently we would write that rho 1 into x plus 1 over rho 1. And so the root, in terms of my general notation over here, xi, or in this case x1, is simply minus 1 over rho 1. So Wold's condition, since that's a root of odd multiplicity, Wold's condition is that minus 1 over rho 1 cannot lie between minus 2 and 2. Since we have a first order process, this root is clearly of odd multiplicity. And uh, hence, it cannot lie in this interval, which, in other words, says that a first order moving average cannot have an autocorrelation coefficient of f at first order, which is greater than 1 half. So this is not possible in this particular situation. Now, that's very easy to see directly. And so we can relate the condition in terms of this factorization to straightforward intuition in the first order case very easily. Um, directly, if we write um, yt as epsilon t minus theta 1, epsilon t minus 1, this has an autocorrelation coefficient of first order in terms of these parameters as minus theta 1 over 1 plus theta 1 squared. That is the first order autocorrelation coefficient for this process. And if we just consider the behavior of this function, we can simply say that it's clear that this coefficient uh, is between minus a half and a half. Okay, the simplest way to get these inequalities out is just to complete the square. Well, now in this case, then, what we've seen in this simple example is that Wold's condition in terms of these polynomials does, in fact, lead to condition a condition upon the autocorrelation function. And working in a completely different way, uh, conditions have recently been derived uh, let me just put the reference down, since I don't have it on my list. General bounds on the autocorrelations have been given by Davies, Pate, Frost, and that's a paper in Biometrica. 1974. So as I say, the answer to the question, can any set of correlation coefficients, which become zero after some point, be the autocorrelations of a moving average process, is no. There are conditions which they must satisfy, and these have been given here. Uh, the world condition was the earlier statement of the equivalent result. Uh, which I find uh, difficult to interpret, except in terms of the process of the uh, solution. Well, now, that completes what I want to say about the moving average process. So let me finally mention generalizations of these two basic processes, which are used in univariate time series analysis, before moving on to look at regression models. So the simplest generalization is to assume that we have an autoregressive model as initially specified in which the disturbances have a moving average representation. And so we shall have the so-called autoregressive moving average model, or abbreviating the ARMAPQ model, which is simply obtained by putting the two elements together, phi of L, yt, is equal to theta of L, epsilon t. And this then, again, looking at the summary measure 
C of Z, the autocovariance function. It's theta of Z, theta of Z inverse, divided by phi of Z, phi of Z inverse. Once again, by setting Z uh, equal to e to the i omega, that is assuming to have modulus 1, we obtain the standard expression for the spectral density function of such a process. The uh, assumptions which one would make on this particular process are a combination of the assumptions which we've made on the two separate elements to date. That is, we would require uh, the roots of the phi polynomial to be less than 1 for stationarity, the roots of the theta polynomial to be less than 1, as just discussed, for in order to achieve identification. Notice that any common factor in phi and theta will cancel out in top and bottom of this covariance generating function, or likewise that it can be cancelled out across the original model relationship without affecting any statement about the relationship between y and epsilon. And so we lose nothing to assume that there are no such common factors existing. Um, so let me lay, um, simply make a note that we can assume uh, without loss of generality no common factors, or let's say simply that, that uh, theta of z and phi of z have no common factors, or equivalently that any common factors have been removed before we, uh, before we start work. As I say, they cancel out here, the autocovariance function is unchanged and the basic relationship also is unchanged. The final univariate model to mention is the a generalization which is used in statistical analysis quite substantially. And this concerns, first of all, series which are non-stationary in a certain way, and secondly, se series which may be observed at periods uh, more than once a year. So if we consider non-stationary seasonal series, then Box and Jenkins propose the following class of model. Um, which I'll write out in all its detail and then attempt to explain. This is the so-called uh, seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average model. And its non-stationarity is basically captured within the two terms involving the simple difference or the seasonal differencing operator. That is, we assume that by some number d of differencing operations, or some number capital D of seasonal differencing operations, that the originally observed series can be reduced to stationarity. Uh, having done that, we then simply observe the possibility that the initial autoregressive polynomial may have factors which are repeated s times, where s is the number of seasons per year, and so we more conveniently can write those in terms of a polynomial, say, capital phi of L, in terms of L to the S itself. And so we have then S being the number of seasons per year, or S uh, observations per year, and hence there may well be the possibility that an observation is correlated not necessarily strongly with the immediately preceding observation, but with the same observation, sorry, the observation of the same season in the preceding year. And so we would observe effects 
at periodicity s in the autocorrelation function, or likewise in the autoregressive polynomials, repeated roots of multiplicity s, which we more conveniently write out in this fashion. <coughs> Similarly, on the moving average side, the same possibility arises. That is, that there may be repeated roots um, in the original moving average polynomial as specified, and hence we simply more conveniently pull them out into the polynomial capital theta in L to the S itself. This would be then referred to as a model of order PDQ by capital P, capital D, capital Q, S, where D, as I've mentioned, is the degree of non-seasonal differencing, which has to be applied to reduce the series to stationarity. Capital D, the degree of seasonal differencing, which may be required. And capital P, capital Q, are the degrees of the polynomials, likewise denoted by the capital letters phi and theta. So these things are polynomials of degree P, Q in L to the S. Now, in practice, this looks a very general uh, class of model. In practice, however, when estimating models of this kind for standard economic time series, the number of elements which are actually required is relatively small. That is to say, typically, the degree of differencing required is simply one or two. Possibly, there may be some interaction between the non-seasonal and the seasonal differencing to the extent that we may find it hard to choose between, say, uh, two non-seasonal differencing operators and no seasonal differencing operators, as opposed to, for example, one of each. Likewise, having specified the mixed uh, seasonal autoregressions or the mixed seasonal moving averages, again, the orders small p and q and big p and q for most economic time series tend to be relatively small. This then uh, completes the discussion of models in use in univariate analysis. And the next thing to do is to look at regression models, that is, by moving from one variable at a time to two variables at a time. That's it. An hour. Less than an hour. The subhead I want to look at is to look at regression models, where I shall write, um, again using a mixture of uh, notations, assume now that I have two variables, that the variable of interest yt is related to some explanatory variable xt together with an error term. And this is the so-called rational distributed lag model by econometricians, or by some econometricians. Time series analysts, control engineers, and so on, refer to it as a transfer function model. Um, where, again, we simply allow these general polynomials to have some particular degree. I've got the the wrong way around. In Box and Jenkins' discussion of this, these uh, models, omega of L has degree S and delta of L degree R. 
apologies for using S for two different things within five minutes. Um, and there would also be the usual sort of conditions which are now, I hope, becoming familiar on the uh, roots of delta of L. In other words, for Y to be stationary, uh, we would normally require this thing to have, uh, to be able to be factorized and to have coefficients within the unit circle. Okay, what I want to say about this particular model is that although it has uh, wide use with a single x variable or with more than one x variable in uh, econometrics. Nevertheless, an implication of this model is that there is a, a representation for the dependent variable of the form which I've been discussing for the first hour or so. And that we can see in the following way, using the uh, results obtained a little while ago. If we assume ut, has an ARMA representation, and I'll now attach a U subscript to P and Q to uh, indicate that that's the variable I'm talking about. And if we assume likewise that X also, taken by itself, behaves in similar fashion, so that X has an ARMA P sub x and Q sub x representation. And finally, if we make the standard assumption about the uh, legitimacy of this model as a single equation for estimation and inference purposes, namely that x is a genuine exogenous variable, that is, x is independent of u at all lags, then we can obtain the uh, corresponding univariate representation for yt itself. And in order to do that, I shall simply write ut in, in uh, terms of the standard notation, theta u of l over phi u of l epsilon t, and likewise xt has the same form, theta x over phi x, say psi t, where psi t is another white noise process. And the exogeneity assumption is that epsilon t and psi t minus l are uncorrelated for all T and L. So there is no relationship between the white noises epsilon and psi at any lag, which has the effect of ensuring that there is no relationship between U and X at any lag. That is, X is a genuine exogenous variable in this relationship. All right, if we simply substitute, then we get a whole mishmash of factors. Omega over delta, um, theta x over phi of x, apply it to psi t, plus um, theta u over phi u, apply it to epsilon t. And of course, this is no longer, um, in any sense, an observable representation in terms of the two terms on the right-hand side, we would normally assume that what's observable is x and not psi, unless we happen to be in a situation in which the theta and phi coefficients were known exactly. If we put this over a common denominator and take that over to the left-hand side, or if you like, multiply through by the common denominators, then what we observe is that we have a model for y, which begins to look like an autoregressive moving average model. With one slight uh, complication, 
So this is what happens here. And basically, what we need in order to show what I'm aiming for, that is to show that Y has an ARMA representation of exactly the same form, but with possibly different autoregressive moving average orders, to show that it has this representation, then what we need to show is that the right-hand side of this last equation does, in fact, represent a moving average process of the form which we've already been considering in some detail. All right, so what, in other words, we need the result that the sum of two moving average processes itself has a moving average representation. Putting this in a in slight shorthand. Now this result again you will see discussed in, an, in the book by Box and Jenkins and you'll find it discussed there in an incomplete fashion. Let me indicate um, why that comes about. Um, let's say IE. Um, if U1T is a moving average process of order Q1, U2 is an MA Q2, then the sum of these two things is an MA Q, where Q is less than or equal to the maximum of Q1 and Q2. Um, if you look at Box and Jenkins' appendix A4.4, then that's the proof which I allege is incomplete. But the argument goes as follows. If U1 is a moving average process of order Q1, it has a corallogram which is zero at all lags greater than Q1. Or sh let's say a covariance function, which is zero at all lags greater than Q1. If U2 is a moving average of order Q2, it also has a covariance function, which is zero at all lags greater than Q2. If we add two such processes, and I realize I haven't said independent, I should have said. Then the sum of those two such independent processes has a covariance function which is zero at all lags greater than the maximum of Q1 and Q2. And they said, therefore, it has a moving average representation. Now, what we saw a little while ago is that it's not necessarily true that any covariance function which becomes zero after a particular point and then stays zero, um, does belong to a legitimate moving average process. And what you need to do in order to complete the proof of that is simply to say, well, there exist some restrictions on the corallogram of the moving average process U1, and likewise on the corallogram of the moving average process U2, and since the corallogram of the summed process is, in effect, a weighted average of those two corallograms with weights which sum to one, it also will satisfy those conditions. And that, in effect, is the step that's needed in order to uh, complete the proof. But, as I say, it isn't there. Um, you will find this discussed more completely. Um, this is incomplete. 
but C. And this reference is on my list. Grange and Morris. Basically fills in the uh, fills in the proof for that case. Um, Okay, so that will do it. Now, the only, the only other point to say, apart from uh, what that proof requires, is the, is the question of why this, has been, why this um, statement about the order of the moving average has been written as an inequality. And the point is that it's possible that the nature of the um, covariance functions for the two component moving averages is such that some of the covariances cancel out when they're added together. Okay, so the let's say the inequality um, is needed since a relatively unusual situation, but nevertheless, let's say since maybe uh, Q1 equals Q2 and the last term, that is gamma one for the U1 process at lag Q1 is equal to the negative of the covariance for the second component process at that same lag. That's pretty unlikely uh, to hold exactly. Granger refers to that as a coincidental situation, but nevertheless, if the coincidence did arise, then it would be clear that the summed process would have order less than the maximum of the two separate ones. All right, so if we now then simply use that result in here, what we get is the process for yt. OK, so uh, let's say then yt has an ARMA Py, Qy representation, and Py is simply the sum of the degrees of the three polynomials appearing on the left. Um, they were uh, R for delta plus Px plus PU, and QY, as we've said, is less than or equal to the max of the components there, which are S plus QX plus PU, R plus um, PX plus QU. That assumes that there is no cancellation um, taking place. So assuming no common factors. That is, no common factors when the things have been put together and is a distinct, is a separate point from the point we're making over here about coincidental situations in Granger's term. That is, when the two moving averages have been put together here, and the single resulting moving average has been calculated by the means I described half an hour ago, then what we're saying is that there is no factor in that composite moving average which cancels out with any factor in these things over on the left-hand side. OK, that's all I want to say about um, these uh, time series models. and. In, and in particular, so hold these notions in reserve. That is to say, uh, in this simple case, we started out with a relationship between a dependent variable, an explanatory variable, and an error term of the standard form, and saw that that could be reduced to a model of the standard statistical univariate form for the dependent variable. This sort of an analysis I shall use uh, in more general situations to say that where uh, a set of variables is generated by a standard econometric type system of equations, nevertheless, it is possible 
to obtain a relationship between that representation and the statistical time series type of representation by going through exactly the same sort of analysis or solution form. Obviously in a slightly more generalized fashion, but nevertheless the results go through in exactly the same way. Just um, in the last few minutes, let me lay out what is going to be the next section, but the details of which I shall not have time to discuss today. And that is to talk about econometric models a little bit and establish some notation and terminology and so on. Uh, if we start out with a simple static uh, model in structural form, then uh, a conventional notation is to write this in the following uh, notation, where these quantities are now all uh, vector quantities. And so we assume that we have a vector uh, dimensions, uh, say, g by 1 of endogenous variables and a vector of k elements of predetermined variables. And this is the standard structural form for describing the simultaneous determination of the endogenous variables in terms of predetermined variables and an error term, which in the classical formulation is usually assumed to be independent over time, although the elements of this vector will usually be cross-correlated contemporaneously. Now, fr from the point of view of dynamic models, this isn't particularly helpful because it is standard in the static formulation to group together within the z vector variables which are purely exogenous variables and also variables which are lag values of the endogenous variable. So the predetermined label is usually taken to cover both of these types of variables. And for dynamic analysis, it's important to separate these out, as we shall see. And so what I want to, what I prefer to do is to introduce um, a slightly different notation, dynamic uh, structural form, where I shall collect together the lagged endogenous variables out of the predetermined vector and simply leave in here the exogenous variables. And in order to do that, I shall slightly redefine the matrix B of contemporaneous, um, or if you like, instantaneous feedback type coefficients and call that B0 and collect uh, the lag values, which may of course be as many as R in number, with coefficients uh, B to 1 through B1 through BR, and uh, then possibly assume that some of my exogenous variables also appear lagged. And so I shall write that out like that. So in other words, the predetermined variable vector which we started out with is being broken down into lagged endogenous variables and exogenous variables which may also appear at di with different dates. And uh, if I introduce now this, the lag operation, lag operator as exactly as before, then I can replace yt minus 1, for example, by lyt. Yt minus r by L to the r, <coughs> yt, and do the same over as far as the x terms are concerned, 
and write this in a more compact form as b of l y t plus gamma of l x t is equal to u t. Okay, so b of l now is a polynomial in the lag operator l whose coefficients are these g by g matrices. Okay, so a typical element of the matrix B of L will simply be, uh, will simply have the form, say, summation beta i j k L to the k. So B of L has terms of that form. There will generally be some normalization rule applied to B0. Okay, so a, a, a simple rule to take would be that B0 has diagonal coefficients of unity. And of course, the fact that B0 in general is not simply a unit matrix distinguishes this as a structural form. That is, the fact that there are some off diagonal elements of B0 which are non zero indicates that, if you like, there is instantaneous feedback or instantaneous relationships between elements of the endogenous variable vector. And that's what, in effect, distinguishes the model that economists work with from the models which are used in many other areas of uh, dynamic analysis. The nothing very much is going to be said about the behavior of the higher order B matrices. We would typically assume that, um, well, typically assume nothing about these matrices and typically find that they may be very sparse. So in other words, if the, the longest lag of an endogenous variable, the rth period lag, occurs just for a single variable, and it also occurs for that variable's appearance in a single equation, then br will just have one non-zero element. So there's nothing being said about how full these matrices are, and typically we would expect to find them very empty. So that's the structural form that I want to uh, look at and the notation that I want to uh, employ. Um, what will follow will be the corresponding ideas of reduced form, uh, final form, dynamic multipliers, and so on. And the result, which as I said a moment ago, generalizes what we did to get to the representation here. But this, I think, is a convenient place to stop and resume this on Wednesday morning. <laughs>